Hello, everyone, and welcome to the series called How Did We Get Here? Being shown here on Think Tech Hawaii. And I am the host of this series. My name is DeSoto Brown. I work as the Bishop Museum Historian at Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. I'm also the curator for the archives department there. And I'm about to take you back on a journey through time, a little story about a particular part of Hawaii's history. And that's what I like to do on my program, to show you and demonstrate to you and explain to you some stories about Hawaii's history that you did not know, but that I think you'll enjoy knowing. And as you can see on the screen right now, it says, enjoy life, eat out more often. Well, the subject for today's program is old menus, historic menus from Hawaii. Now, you may be thinking, okay, that's kind of interesting, but what's the point? The point is that I want to show you not only what these menus look like in terms of how they were presented to people in the old days, and secondly, what's on those menus, things that you would either never have, you've either never heard of, or that you'll find surprising, or that you may find maybe a little bit disturbing, which you wouldn't imagine could be the case with menus, but it can be. And I also want to emphasize these menus are from my personal collection. They're not from Bishop Museum. And menus are not easy to find. Menus are very dis disposable. Menus get dirty. They get food spilled on them. They get liquid spilled on them, and they get thrown away. And so it's hard to find old menus. And that's why I'm sure that these are going to be very unfamiliar to you in a good way. So... Here is an overview of what I'm talking about. Here happen to be three selected menus from the collection. And again, I'm emphasizing that these show you what things used to look like. Now, I have to point out that the Donald Duck drive-in design on the right is not a menu. It's actually a matchbook, an advertising matchbook. But the point is that this is what the graphics of menus used to look like. And again, Graphics for commercial articles, commercial graphics and designs change a lot. They are very prone to go through changes because styles change and what people think looks modern and attractive change. So once something looks old fashioned, menus have to keep up with trends just like everything else does. And that's another reason that they get discarded. And they also get discarded intentionally because the prices change and prices change on menus all the time. And when prices go up, all the old menus have to be thrown away. And I also want to just mention too that paper printed menus like this are becoming rarer because today more and more restaurants either have their menus online. So you look at, you look at the menu on your phone uh, at the venue, at the restaurant itself, or there may be a screen at the restaurant that you choose from, and there aren't paper menus anymore at all. And that's a downside for history because it means that we're going to lose that information. It's not going to be available for us to readily access anymore because once it's digital, it can go away forever without any printed or physical things left behind. All right, let's get started here. And we're going to begin by looking at some of the things that are available on old menus. This is a menu from a restaurant and nightclub that was located in Waikiki. And as you can see from the design of the cover, it was called The South Seas at Waikiki. Uh, that doesn't mean there was another South Seas. It just means it, this one was located in Waikiki. And listed here, and I'm going to be reading these out to you just in case it's hard for you to see them if you're looking at this particularly on your phone. The things listed are, two of them are familiar. There's mahi-mahi, and there's also oysters. But at the top, fried pond mullet. Okay, what's mullet? Mullet is a type of fish that's native to the Hawaiian Islands that's particularly good tasting. But notice that this says pond mullet. Well, this is something which has actually got a lot more history behind it than you would think. And that is because there once were numerous traditional Hawaiian fish ponds found throughout the Hawaiian islands. And they used a technology that Hawaiians developed centuries ago. And basically, when you look at this photograph, this is a picture of Kuapa Pond 
in what is now called Hawaii Kai. And this picture is from the 1950s. Kuapa Pond today is now used purely for recreation for the suburb of Hawaii Kai, which was developed around it starting in 1961. But it is or was a fish pond that produced fish in abundance. And in the foreground of this picture, you can see there's a wall and then there is an opening in the wall. And the opening is an important part of this entire technology. This is called a makaha. And this opening is sort of covered by a grill work, you might say, or a woven panel. And the point is that little fish from the ocean can swim in. This is a brackish pond, so it's part uh, freshwater, part, part salt water. Small fish from the ocean can swim in. Once they get inside the pond and they start to grow, they get too big to be able to get out. And so then they are confined to the pond. They're easy to catch. You can catch them with nets. And then once you are raising a lot of mullet, which is what we're talking about in this case, they can be caught and they can go to the fish market. And then they can get purchased to be served in restaurants. Mullet are commonly found on these older menus, particularly from before World War II. That means that the fish ponds were still functioning on Oahu. Well, like Kuapa Pond in this photograph, most of those fish ponds aren't functional anymore. They've either fallen into disrepair, they have been intentionally filled in, or they simply aren't being managed anymore to produce fish. So today you can't get mullet, particularly not on a menu, because the fish ponds are gone, but you used to be able to. So this one small item shows you a major shift in the food supply that was available. And it also shows you how even into the 20th century, the fish ponds were functional. And for the most part, they no longer are. Now, another unexpected item. <laughs> And I'll read this to you, too. This comes from the Waikiki Tavern, which was in Waikiki, and I'll read it. The Waikiki Tavern is known the world over for its frog's legs. And the fried frog's legs cost a dollar. Frog's legs. I can assure you, you are not going to see frog's legs on menus anymore. And why is this? Well, on the left-hand side, there is an ad from this same uh, Waikiki Tavern menu that says M. Otani and Company, all the fresh fish and fresh frogs used by the Waikiki Tavern are supplied. on a number of menus. Now, if you've never had frog's legs, they may sound kind of weird and maybe not tasty. I've actually eaten frog's legs, and as the old saying goes, they do taste like chicken. So they actually were good. You're never going to see them again, though. From the Royal Cafe, which was located in downtown Honolulu, and you're definitely not going to be read, able to read this because it is small. Under the title of Fish and Oysters, uh, Filet of Ulua, Ulua is a deep sea fish, or a, it, it's an ocean fish, and you can still find Ulua sometimes, uh, but usually just as a special. Uh, fried or broiled pond mullet, I just described all of that, shrimps, oysters, lobsters, but then fried turtle steak for 30 cents. And again, you'll notice the prices are ridiculous by our standards today. But turtle steak. Turtles were also found on menus and even into up into the 1960s. Turtles today are protected. You can't catch them. Uh, I think that's been since the 1970s. And there are three types of turtles that are found in the waters around the Hawaiian Islands, but these would probably have been the green sea turtle. Turtles had been served for centuries, uh, certainly in Europe, and Hawaiians traditionally did catch and eat turtles as well. So 
This was just a normal thing at the time. And here's a menu from the 1960s. This is from a restaurant called Pineapple Hill, which was located or, uh, near the Kapalua Resort that was developed on the island of Maui. And it was built in what had been, I believe, an old plantation manager's home. And on the right-hand side, this is the top of the first page of the menu, and it says, Bill of Fare, our own Maui turtle soup with sherry. And then as the first listing for the complete dinners, fresh Maui turtle steak, a rare Hawaiian delicacy caught off Maui's shores, served with red wine sauce, $5.55. That was a fairly expensive entree at that time in the 60s. Today, we find the idea of eating turtles to be kind of shocking. And this is very good evidence of that. This is the Bishop Museum promotional license plate, which was introduced in 2001, and which you can still get today. And you can put it on your vehicle. Uh, you put both of them on your vehicle and drive around promoting Bishop Museum. We'll notice that the design for Bishop Museum is, in fact, a turtle, a honu. Uh, honu, of course, is the Hawaiian word. The reason we find the idea of eating, catching and eating and killing turtles to be kind of shocking is because today, honu are treated as though they are cuddly friends of the ocean. And there's a lot of affection for them. And they have been treated, again, as uh, almost like cartoon characters in that they've become so, we treat them with such affection. And people go to see them when they come up on the beaches in certain places. And it's because now they are protected. And so their numbers have increased a great deal. But for somebody who's accustomed to the idea of Honu uh, charm bracelets, like a, a, a jewelry charm that's shaped like a turtle or a stuffed plush toy animal that's like a Honu. And there are children's books about Honu. So this is why the idea of eating them and them being on menus is disturbing. And they never were a major uh, catch for fishing boats because there weren't that many of them. So when they were served, it was usually not very common, particularly by the 1960s. In any case, that's something else that you find on a menu you wouldn't expect. Okay, from the Star Grill from the 1930s, under the heading of cereal. So these are breakfast foods. And there are hotcakes, waffles, uh, pancakes, shredded wheat with milk, cornflakes with milk. But then at the top of the list, bowl of poi for five cents. So this is interesting, again, from the 1930s, that a regular restaurant that's serving American food also includes poi as, again, a breakfast food. You're certainly not going to find that today. And of course, there were and are Hawaiian restaurants that specialize in Hawaiian cooking. But this is something intermingled with, as, I, as you can clearly see, the regular American foods. And Hawaiian food shows up more frequently than you might think. Again, regular restaurant menus from this time period. This is a menu from 1959. And it was from a restaurant that was mostly for its, its, it was in business for many years. It was mostly called M's Tavern in downtown Honolulu. At this point, it's also named the Cheerio Room and M's Coffee Tavern. But in the box on the right, you see what's called exotic dishes, especially popular with M's guests. Now, they're calling these exotic because they're not a regular American food, but it's showing you a disparity between what local people would consider, in many cases, just normal food, and for other people who aren't necessarily from here and are patronizing this restaurant in downtown Honolulu, to let them know, okay, we also serve stuff that's not hamburgers and other things that you're familiar with. So listed here is curry, chow mein, beef heka, uh, Chinese style shrimp, but then on Wednesday and Saturday, Lao Lao and Poi, dollar five. And Lao Lao and Poi with Lomi Lomi salmon, a dollar thirty-five. Exotic, but regular enough and something that was in enough demand that they had it on their menu as a twice a week special. 
And you might not expect to be seeing something like Hawaiian food necessarily on a country club menu. This is the Oahu Country Club located in Nuuan Valley. And this is a menu from January 22nd, 1964. And again, there's the usual types of stuff in the appetizers, but there's also the Waimea Poi cocktail. And a Poi cocktail, I believe, was Poi uh, mixed with, I think, milk and sugar. And it was served in a glass and you could drink it. But also under the entrees, mahi mahi, curry, pot roast, but then lao lao with poi, $1.25. So there were enough people who were members of Oahu Country Club and or their guests who were familiar with Hawaiian food, who ate Hawaiian food and were and wanted to eat more Hawaiian food. actually a paper napkin, an imprinted paper napkin that's been folded and then stuck into a slot so that it is, the actual cover is not only the cover, but a paper menu that's stuck into that. And it's Santa's beard. I think that's really clever. Okay. What's listed here? Well, the usual things that we've already seen, you know, brown filet, veal, veal cutlet, etc. but also frog's legs, yet again, calf's liver and bacon. Liver was something that was commonly eaten. Liver shows up on a lot of menus then. People used to purchase liver from the grocery store or from uh, butchers or meat stores. Um, people I'm sure still eat liver, but it's not on menus anymore. And that's something a lot of people would find kind of strange today. But also, and importantly here, tender fried rabbit pan gravy. All right, rabbits, yes, we know rabbits are eaten, but we sure don't find them on menus. And again, rabbits are cute and fluffy, and a lot of people today would be a little disturbed by the idea of eating a cute, fluffy rabbit. That's something you want to pat and be nice to and not kill and eat, um, <laughs> particularly for Christmas, but there you are. This is from the Coconut Grove Inn in Kailua. This is from the 1930s. And these are triple decker sandwiches, three decker sandwiches, meaning there are three pieces of bread with two layers of filling, plain or toasted. And some of these, a lot of this is just not what you would find strange, but peanut butter and jelly it is a serve, is something being served by the restaurant to adults. This is not for kids. There were no kiddie menus at this time. That was a development probably of certainly the 1950s or and later, in which there were special dishes just for children. Before that, uh, there were maybe children's portions that they charged less for, but there was no special, like, here's something just for children. Well, even today, you would not find a peanut butter and jelly sandwich served in a restaurant, even just for the children's menus, Today you get children's uh, being offered uh, chicken nuggets and chicken tenders and french fries, but no more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But this is for adults. This is not for kids. And that's a social change that you would not expect at all. I mean, I still find it amusing and strange. They've also got peanut butter and pimento cheese. You find a lot of unusual things on, on old menus that you wouldn't come up with even trying to think about them. Anyway, go have a peanut butter sandwich, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at uh, the Kailu, at the Coconut Grove Inn for 25 cents if you'd like. No, I'm sorry, they're not available anymore. From the Aloha Grill, this is another thing that I find amusing and interesting and very intriguing. There used to be what were called soda fountains and soda fountains could be just a freestanding uh, business by themselves but also in some cases restaurants had their own soda fountain within the larger restaurant and this meant that they served specialty things usually made from ice cream 
and different types of flavored sodas. So there were all these different soda fountain offerings that today we don't know what the heck they are. So here's what was available from the soda fountain. Um, the Black Cow, which used Hire's Root Beer, and then the Jersey Cow. I know the name Black Cow, but I don't know what the heck that is. What else is there offered here? Hawaiian Delight for 15, 15 cents. Waikiki Surf, 20 cents. No explanation of what those are. This, these were probably specialties just of this particular restaurant. So if you wanted to know, you'd have to ask one of the wait service people, what the heck is this? And then at the bottom, AIDS, meaning some kind of a flavored soda. So there's grape juice, lemonade, strange combination. Uh, there's also the Hawaiian freeze and the mint lime freeze. And those are expensive. They're 30 cents. I really want to know what those were. But of course, there's no way to know what they were today. And here's a restaurant from uh, that was located in Wahiawa right outside of Schofield Barracks. It was called Kimo'o Farm. It was in business for decades. This is from 1947. And again, in that same realm of soda farm drinks, these are called egg drinks. Angel Kiss, Alaska Snowball, Broadway Flip. We'll never know what the heck those things were. But also, egg drinks implies to me that they are including a raw egg being mixed into the drink. That is something that would probably be illegal today because raw eggs can be frequently can be carriers of salmonella and food poisoning is no picnic. Food poisoning can be serious. So things that can give you food poisoning, uncooked things usually are now prohibited. I know uh, you can probably possibly still get steak tatar in some restaurants and that's a raw egg mixed with raw ground beef, um, which is either not cooked at all or just lightly cooked. But if something like this is served, there has to be a warning that there is the possibility of food poisoning and you eat it at your own risk. So no, you're not going to get raw egg drinks anymore in a restaurant. And just like we saw unusual names for soda fountain drinks, we also see unusual names for alcoholic drinks. This is Ernie's Green Lantern. This was a restaurant located in Waikiki, and this is from the 1930s. And from 1920 up to 1933, uh, prohibition was in effect in the United States, and that meant it was illegal to make alcohol. It was illegal to serve alcohol. So restaurants, bars could not serve it. Everybody who was drinking alcohol was either was breaking the law because it was either imported from another country, which was illegal, or it was being made here in the USA someplace, which was also illegal. Well, once prohibition ended, the issues in the 1930s began to uh, show a list a lot of different cocktails that were available. And so here we have flips and toddies, brandy flip, sherry flip, and then hot rum toddy and hot whiskey toddy. Now, I have to say, I, I confess, I do not drink alcohol and I never have. So I am clueless about what ingredients there are in a variety of different types of cocktails. But I'm sure that not only would you not be able to necessarily order those today, but from this menu, which is from Chapman's of Waikiki, and it's from the early 1950s, listed under long, cool drinks, we have absinthe frap. And I don't I thought that absinthe was illegal, but that may not be case, the case. Angel's Tip, Brandy Daisy, um, Gin Daisy, John Collins, not to be confused with the more commonplace Tom Collins, King Alfonso, Mamie Taylor, and Ward 8. What the heck are those? If you went to a, a bar or restaurant today and ordered a Ward 8, or a gin daisy, I'm sure nobody would have any idea what went into one of those. The only way you would find out is if you could talk to an older bartender who might remember some of these, or if you found a recipe booklet for them. Otherwise, they're gone. And there are tons of these intriguing names too that show up on all menus. 
Now I want to just show you the graphics that you sometimes find on menus. And uh, up until, well, for a long time, many of them, as I've already shown you, were just plain text on with maybe some artistic, uh, maybe a little motif or something. But sometimes, particularly later on, you start to see these beautiful designs. And I admire the graphic artists who produce these. And the Blue Ocean Inn has a lot of wonderful motifs on it. As you can see, I'm looking at it so I can describe it to you. Clearly making it, uh, making it clear that this is at Waikiki. There's a surfer, there's Diamond Head, there is a canoe on shore. But then on the left, there are different things which kind of suggest a cornucopia of different types of foods. So there's a pineapple and there's a kihihihi. You don't eat those, but you eat fish. And then at the top, there's a suggestion of either a breadfruit or a pineapple. Again, it's artistic creativity that I like. Ciro's restaurant was located on Hotel Street in downtown Honolulu, and there was a more famous Ciro's restaurant in Hollywood, either Hollywood or Los Angeles, which was known as a place where many movie stars ate. I don't know what the connection was between the two, but the logo type here that says Ciro's that you can see depicted on the front wall of the restaurant is the same as the famous sign, which was on the one in California. But regardless of whether there was a connection or not. This was a restaurant that served both lunch and dinner, and it, uh, it had kind of... So I have very fond memories of Ciro's. And this is a very abstract, but very typical late 40s, early 50s type of design um, in terms of what graphic standards were at that time. Here's the Club Blue Lay. This is Honolulu's smartest theater restaurant. And even though it was located on Kalakaua Avenue, it wasn't in Waikiki. It was uh, Mauka of the intersection with Kapilani Boulevard. Nonetheless, look at this design. It's a total fantasy. It's a palm tree to make it clear that you're in Hawaii. But here is a topless woman holding a lei. You could not have a photograph of such a thing, but you could turn this into artwork, and it isn't considered censorable by that time. This is from 1952. Now I'm going to show you three different separate graphic artists who were very prolific uh, in their time period here in the Hawaiian Islands. This first piece is from an M's Tavern restaurant. I've already explained about M's Tavern. And there's a little title in the lower left corner that says hibiscus, because of course hibiscus flowers are featured in it. This is by a man named H.B. Christian. And he did a lot of artwork that got published locally, particularly in a magazine, which was called Paradise of the Pacific. And so he did a lot of art that went on the covers of Paradise of the Pacific, a lot of designs used on the inside. And his work also shows up on other menus as well. And this is a beautiful picture. It's just pretty, it's nice, it's nice to look at. This is a design by a man named Theodore uh, J. Mundorf. And he was better known as Ted Mundorf. This is for the Cup of Gold, Cup of Gold restaurant on Bethel Street in downtown Honolulu. Mundorf was known from the 1940s into the 1950s for the artwork he did of individual tropical flowers. And these were reproduced as prints that were on poster board. And they were very, very popular locally for people to put up, to frame and put up and hang on the walls in their homes. So those are still com not common, but you can still find those today. He did not do a lot of other artwork that showed people, although some of his frameable pieces were Hawaiian women or uh, idealized Hawaiian women, let's say. But this is a whole picture that, um, again, is very out of character or is very different from other Mundor pieces, which is why when I found this, I was particularly happy to find out that he did other work that I wasn't familiar with. And Queen Surf Menu, 
from the late 1940s. Queen Surf opened in 1946, and it finally was shut down in the early 1970s to be turned into parkland or open park space for the public at Waikiki. This design is by a man named Jerry Chong. Jerry Chong worked for one of, or perhaps both of the Honolulu newspapers, uh, certainly the Star Bulletin, but I think maybe the advertiser as well. He did a lot of designs for news stories, but he also did other graphics. In those days, um, the newspapers printed a lot more unique, separate uh, graphics that were created just for a particular article, for example. So that's the type of thing that Jerry Chong did, but he also did uh, sheet music covers and other artwork like this one for the menu. This was a well-known restaurant in Waikiki at the corner of Kalakaua Avenue and Kalaimoku Street, and it was called Canlis, Canlis's Broiler, in fact. Uh, there, the restaurant had started further down Kalakaua Avenue, but, and it was just called The Broiler, but it had to close down in that location when the block was cleared for the construction of the Waikiki Biltmore Hotel, long gone, you've never heard of it. Um, and so they moved to their own custom designed modernist restaurant in 1954. And this is the restaurant. And as you can see on the right, that's a picture of the restaurant. And on the left, the menu cover also depicts the restaurant. They were proud of it because it was a very distinctive building. It combined various tropical elements, Japanese elements, but put them together in a uniquely American modern style. And the building was designed by an architect named Wimberley. And in addition to the picture of the restaurant on the menu, you can see on the left side, vertically, there's an amalgamation of some idealized Hawaiian carvings. Now, Hawaiians never made anything that actually looked like this thing, because this is actually an amalgamation of these elements turned into a totem pole. And totem poles are indigenous to the native people who live on in the Pacific Northwest of North America in uh, not only the United States, but Canada. And so these ki'i or tiki have been turned into a fantasy depiction. And this was very popular in the 1950s. This is the tiki era of popular design and popular culture in the United States and here. And another type of uh, indigenous Hawaiian design that also got used in those days were petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are carvings in rock surfaces. And petroglyphs are found throughout the Hawaiian Islands. And they are very simple designs of s often stick figures like what you see here. These two restaurants, the Royal Lanai, which was in Waikiki, and Jojan, which was located on the grounds of what's now Kahala Mall, but was then called the Wailai Shopping Center, do not copy petroglyph designs exactly, but they use them as, as inspiration for 1950s and 60s motifs, which harkened back to those traditional ones. So there's an element of Hawaiian culture here, but it's been turned into something different for graphic design. And something else that's very indigenous and it's something that we're still familiar with today is lauhala. That is leaves from the hala tree that are dried, stripped, turned into, uh, you know, worked until they are able to be woven or actually the correct term is plated into different objects and mats. Well, the backgrounds of each of these menus is lauhala. And on the left is uh, Hale Nanea, and on the right is Leroy's, which was on Ala Moana Boulevard. And during this time period in the 20th century, the local government of the territory of Hawaii was actually encouraging, through monetary grants, people to uh, do lauhala in their homes as a cottage industry in a way that rural people could make money. And what they turned, the, the materials that they created were for sale. And at that point, nobody made a great deal of money. So they were very affordable 
So a lot of people bought objects made of lauhala. Therefore, it was something that was commonly found in people's homes. And so the backgrounds of these menus use it to show that it's local, to hearken to the Hawaiian culture, to use that as a motif that people would be familiar with, but also that looks nice. And finally, here's our final example. A number of local companies would advertise themselves in restaurant menus if that restaurant used their product. And so Mayflower Coffee, which is Kona Coffee, was run was a brand of coffee that was uh, owned by and run by one of the local big five companies, one of the big local corporations that were referred to as the big five. And if your restaurant served Mayflower Coffee exclusively, they had this stock menu that you could use for presumably for free. The inside of the menu was blank, so you could print, have your own restaurant's menu printed on the inside. This one has an imprint on the cover that says Paramount Cafe. But the design was something that was used by other restaurants as well if they served Mayflower Kona Coffee. I think this is a beautiful picture. I think this is a very evocative picture. It has a landscape which is... flower behind her ear by this dramatic red mu'umu'u, and finally, what looks like any limole that she's wearing. And I, I love this design. And it's just something that was produced commercially, but it was done very skillfully by whoever the artist was. And for something that was kind of a throwaway, a menu that you would look at very briefly and put aside, it's really beautiful. I'm very proud to have it in my collection to be able to show it to people who I hope will appreciate it the way I do. Okay, thanks for joining me. I'm DeSoto Brown. You've just been watching How Did We Get Here? And the title of this episode was We Used to Eat That. And you saw why I said that we ate that. Yeah, we did eat that. Um, I hope you will be joining me in the future for other programs I'm going to be doing here on ThinkTech. And you also can look back at other programs I've already done that are available also on YouTube. So until I see you again and you see me again, thanks for joining me. Aloha.